today uh, I am talking about cosmic illusion. Now, <coughs> let us see what what I mean by this. Uh, illusion, as you know, means you get something uh, in front of you. You look at it and you think it is you are looking at something uh, which you have in your own mind that it is that. But in reality, it may be something else. So, what is not there uh, is what you see. So, let's uh, see uh, some of the examples. Uh, now, we always say seeing is believing. That is, unless you see it with your eyes, you won't believe it. But the question is, uh, even if you see it with your eyes, can, can you believe it? So, illusions are of that kind. And now you know this uh, mirror, mirror on the wall, it's part of a fairy tale. And uh, uh, you can think of a mirror uh, which you see in a, a fair like situation where you go and uh, enjoy yourself, there are rides and so on. And in such a situation, uh, you find that uh, there are curved mirrors and in front of those mirrors if you stand you see your uh, uh, reflection uh, which is of obviously not uh, what the reality is. So these such mirrors are supposed to give you uh, an idea of illusion. This is another one. And uh, in fact, there are all different kinds of mirrors with different curvature uh, and they are uh, all demonstrating to us that by bending light, because when you throw a ray of light, uh, it gets reflected uh, in a mirror. But if the mirror is itself <coughs> curved, then the direction it will go to may be quite unexpected and that is what uh, these images are uh, showing. Now, <coughs> there are other examples uh, which are more natural. These mirrors are man-made and they are specifically designed uh, to reflect you, your image in a strange way. But what are called mirages uh, in uh, real life uh, are examples of uh, seeing something, but you should not believe it. So let's see an example. Here you see uh, this images, uh, and the reflection which you see in the uh, here, if you see, it gives the impression that there is some water around. And normally you expect to see reflection of a tree in, a, in water. So that kind of uh, reflection you are expecting, you are seeing here, uh, but, not, but there is no water. Uh, as you know in Mirage, uh, it is all desert region and <coughs> there is no water to reflect it. So uh, what you are seeing is something else. So similarly, uh, if you see mirages in deserts, you can also see mirages in space if you go up into in the sky. Uh, astronauts are uh, known to have seen these. So here you see uh, things, uh, polar region, cool, very cold, and you see here uh, things in the sky or in on the uh, floating in the sky which are not really there. So <coughs> one can say that optical illusions are reminders that even the straightforward light can mislead us. We know that light travels in a straight line and based on that assumption we always interpret the images formed by light. And if those uh, light rays are 
not really traveling in a straight line but in a curved direction, then you will get into uh, this question of illusion. So uh, let us see further. You can ask this question that you have bending of light uh, by curved mirrors. You can also have bending of light by refraction. You know when light goes from one medium to another, it changes direction. And that is also sometimes responsible for showing us images in a form which the source is not conforming to. So, uh, we can ask this question, which uh, was originally asked by Newton, the or originator of the law of gravitation. Uh, now, my question was, apart from reflection and the refraction of light, what, is there any other way of doing, of uh, bending the light ray? And the question which people pose to Newton or Newton himself pose, uh, pose and uh, try to get an answer uh, was the following. Uh, this is uh, what is called uh, here, here this is query. Query means question. Now Newton was a true scientist. What I call by true scientist, I mean uh, he only believed what he could prove based on the evidence uh, in front of it. He would not speculate. So uh, he had this question bothering him. The question is, do not bodies act upon light in a distance and by their action bend its rays? And is not this action, they say, let's say, the expression of stress, uh, strongest at the least distance? So he is asking this question that when light travels uh, near a very massive body, now a massive body uh, will attract any other body to itself. That we know. But the question was, the question is, Newton posed was, is it possible for massive bodies to attract light also? So this is the question uh, here. Now you see this example. What you have here, uh, this is a massive object, massive body, and here is a star, and the star sends a ray of light. Now, supposing the ray of light is not attracted by the mass, the massive body here, then it will follow this blue track straight, uh, ignoring its existence. But if this body is uh, attracting light, then light will follow this red path, which is bending straight. So, Newton's question to himself was, which of these is the correct answer? And this particular question, uh, when he put it in his book called Optics, which was on light, uh, he asked, uh, he, he, he rather asked others, but he knew nobody knew the answer. And if, it, if nobody knew the answer and he himself did not know the answer, he would just admit it and put it as query. Let future generations find out whether which of these alternatives is right. Now, several years passed and then came Albert Einstein on the scene with a new theory of gravity. It is called the general theory of gravity, relativity. And it is uh, uh, supposed to be the centenary, centenary year of relativity. Because you see this proposal of the theory, the theory was formulated in 1915. And 
we are now in 2050. So 100 years have passed. So this is a, a very important year uh, in terms of the age of this area. So the answer Einstein gave to Newton's query was yes. You see here. That means he said yes, the light spec. Now this was based on his theory of relativity. And so the question was, how do we know? How do we decide this? So as you know, in science, Howsoever important a person is, simply because he says this is a, like this and that, you don't believe it. You say that we want to perform our own experiment and decide whether what you are saying is right or wrong. So uh, there was an uh, astronomer called Eddington, whom you see here. Uh, Einstein had visited Eddington in Cambridge and they had they were chatting together uh, in a on a bench outside the observatory where Eddington lived. So they, there uh, of course Eddington was one of the very few people who understood what general relativity was about. Because it had a reputation that it is an extremely difficult uh, theory. <coughs> so, uh, in fact, I can tell you one verse which was uh, being uh, recited in about relativity. It was like this To Einstein, Hare, and Violet, we owe our final nod, though so understood by just two men, by himself and sometimes by God. So, this was the uh, aspect. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one could ask, why do you include God as a man, why not a woman? So, you have to take it as a general sense. So, uh, Eddington was actually one of the very few people who understood relativity. And he was a good astronomer. So he felt that an experiment can be done in the following way that if you take the sun, uh, let, let's suppose there is a sun and imagine stars behind the sun and you are on uh, in front of the sun. So you are here, then there is the sun and there are stars behind. Now the ray of light which comes from the star to you if there were no sun, would come, they would come in straight line. But according to Einstein, if the light is being bent, then if there is a sun-like object, it will bend the ray of light coming from the star. And when it bends, uh, the image of the star would shift. So here what is shown uh, is, are some arrows. I don't know whether you can make out, but these legs are indicating that these star images should shift uh, their position. And the idea was, Eddington's idea was that in, uh, they should uh, be able to measure this shift. So if the image shifts, it means that light is in the being back. <coughs> Now you will ask this question that if you have the sun in the sky and you are looking for stars behind the sun, uh, which will come in, uh, on the edge of the sun uh, when it is bending. So uh, how is it possible to, go, to see or to be able to make sure that there is a star out there when the sky is full of sunlight? Surely nobody would think of looking for stars in broad daylight. So how do you manage this experiment? So Eddington's answer was that if you have a solar eclipse, when the sun is covered, so remember the sun is covered but it is still there 
and it is there to bend the ray of light, but it is not spoiling your experiment because sun itself is blocked out. So, so it, there was an eclipse in 1919 when uh, this experiment could be performed. Now, when Eddington performed this experiment, what he had to do was to take, uh, they decided to have two teams of astronomers, one going to uh, Brazil and the other going to uh, part of Africa uh, called Guinea. Uh, because the region from where you could see total solar eclipse was very limited. It is always along a thin strip. And they chose uh, areas which were possible, uh, which where the eclipse was possible to see clearly, where there was no chance of rain or the weather was good. All these considerations went into it, and uh, he chose two uh, uh, places, as I just now said. And among those, he he himself went to one, and he said send the other team to the second place. Of course, he was slightly selfish in the sense that he learned that one of the places there was a chance of rain. So he sent his colleagues there and he himself <laughs> took what was believed to be very dry place. Now, there, there are a lot of interesting things happened on that experiment. and. Uh, what happened, for example, was uh, the place which Eddington had chosen, it had lot of rain in the morning. And he, he was really worried whether he can do this experiment in early afternoon. But the rain gradually cleared and the uh, clouds were there, but the clouds also cleared and he could just do the experiment. Uh, his uh, other team, uh, they had done some uh, homework and they said we will take two telescopes, one big telescope and one standby small telescope. And both these telescopes were taken from Oxford uh, for this particular experiment. But when they uh, reached their uh, destination, it uh, which was in southern hemisphere, what they needed to do uh, was to re readjust their telescope to be usable at a different latitude. And they had somehow forgotten to do it. And when they took it out and uh, they were going to uh, measure, they realized that they, this telescope, this telescope cannot do the work. So uh, they were in a state of panic and they had brought this small one, standby telescope. So they said, we'll use that. So that is what was used. So you see that uh, even well-planned experiments can have snacks and you have to think on the spot. Anyway, uh, Eddington and uh, the others uh, got a lot of data, like uh, those charts which you saw in stellar images. And uh, the second thing they had to do, uh, for example, Eddington was supposed to compare those images to the state when there is no bending of light, no sun in between the star and the and yourself. So this comparison, which should have been made by going to back to Oxford, uh, no, so by by doing it the same experiment the next day without eclipse, then you can get a real difference and you can work out. But uh, at that time, there was some kind of strike going on uh, of uh, companies which had boats going from A to B. In those days, there were no aeroplanes to travel. So people went in big steamers and the uh, uh, labor on the steamer had gone on strike. So, uh, Eddington had to make sure that he goes home in time for doing completing the data analysis. So, he 
did not wait for uh, this uh, measurement, uh, second measurement, and he said he will do it in Oxford, uh, where the original telescope was placed. So this kind of uh, error, this introduces additional error in the experiment. However, here you see that on 6th of November 1990, the Royal Society had arranged a meeting where Eddington presented his data. And there was a uh, distinguished uh, astronomer, uh, relativist called A. N. Whitehead, who had described uh, what the atmosphere the feeling was in the room. The whole atmosphere of intense interest was exactly that of a Greek drama. We were the chorus commenting on the decree of destiny as disclosed in the development of a supreme incident. There was in the background the picture of Newton to remind us that the greatest of scientific generalizations was now after more than two centuries to receive its first modification. So what uh, this uh, scientist is trying to tell you is that people were aware that uh, if Eddington got data which supported Einstein's theory, then Newton's theory turns out to be wrong and or incomplete and Einstein replaces Newton. So this was a very big event which they were witnessing and they were aware of this particular thing. So let us now, this was 1990 and this was the first example of people seeing light being affected by massive objects. So let us now see what happened uh, 20 years later. Um, around 20 years. In 1937, there was a maverick astronomer uh, called Fritz Wicke. Try pronouncing this name with two Z's. Fritz Wicke. Uh, your tongue will not cooperate. Uh, he was the first astronomer to see the possibility of a phenomenon of this phenomenon recurring on a grander scale. So what Vicky said, and he was a uh, good, good astronomer, but he was always fighting with other people, so he, was a, he always worked in isolation. Now his statement was that uh, just as that particular experiment with Edding Tertie showed light paint by a sun, why not have a very big object like a galaxy which contains uh, uh, hundreds of billions of suns. That will bend light much more effectively and we should be able to see uh, galaxies acting as sources of bending of light. So here you see uh, uh, observing himself. Now when Vicky said this, as I told you, it, it was recorded in, in some article he wrote, but nobody took him very seriously because he, he was always uh, quarreling with uh, other astronomers. So this whole idea was more or less forgotten that Vicky had said this. And uh, much later, in 1979, Astronomers suddenly realized uh, what Vicky was saying was correct. So uh, let us see now what happened in 1979. So what happened was astronomers saw double, that is two things. What, they, what, they, what I call double was a pair of quasars. Uh, this was discovered by radio images and with optical images. So quasars are type objects, but they are much more powerful than stars. Uh, a typical quasar can outshine a whole galaxy. 
but it is very very concentrated <coughs> source of energy. So uh, what was found was there were two quasars whose catalog number is given here. 0957561 and this is a way of cataloging objects telling you where it is located in the sky. So just as on our earth we have latitude and longitude and if you want to tell where a particular place is you have to give its latitude and longitude. So in the same way it is 0957 <coughs> plus 561 is a way of giving two coordinates on the sky which will identify that particular quasar. And what they found and what you see here is two quasars. That means they are very close to each other and they were very close in appearance. This is very important. The sources looked alike. You see the images here, what, what is shown here. This is one quasar and this is another. Now you can do image processing, that is playing with the images done on the computer. So you can imagine this image is subtracted from this image. Then what is left is a small bubble, not here. So, uh, what the argument was, was that these two are two quasars and there is a, a galaxy which is superposed on it and uh, that is why you are, after you remove this part by subtracting this, you are, there is nothing here and we can ask what is this, what does this galaxy mean. So, uh, we continue and uh, let's see. What was found with, in the case of these two quasars was their appearance was very similar both in optics and radio and when they took their spectrum, you see this is the kind of spectrum which is dividing the light from the object into different colors just as you do with a prism uh, which you hold in some sunlight. The sunlight gets split into seven colors. So you get different lines when you split it in a spectro spectroscope. And so you have here two quasars. There is a, this, uh, what the spectrum is shown like this. Now they are so similar that the observers who are <coughs> taking those spectrum, when they saw first spectrum, that's okay. When they saw the second one matching so much the first one. They thought that they had perhaps chosen the first one again by mistake to make the observation. So they went back to make, make sure they were looking at the second object and they still got a very similar uh, spectrum. So this is the uh, uh, similarity uh, and uh, because you don't see such uh, objects very often, they attracted a lot of attention and they were called twin quasars just as we see twin brothers, twin sisters uh, and so as astronomers say that somehow two quasars very similar to each other as such is born from same source so let us call them twin quasars so they were called like that but people were not satisfied with this particular feature. They said we, we are not able to understand why they look so much alike. What is the reason for this twin-like behavior? And <coughs> then they realized, somebody at the railway, that the astronomers were looking at two images of a single source. If there is one source which is producing two images and you are seeing both those images, they will be alive because they are from the same source. So how can two images form? So this is the question. And here you see the schematic uh, drawing. This is the source. 
there is an object or a galaxy which is bending light and you are looking from here. So the light ray, one light ray comes this way uh, on one side of this road, bends and you see it image here. The second one comes on the other side of this, bends and you see the image here. So you are seeing the same source uh, by, via two different line directions and that is why you are seeing uh, here double. <coughs> now they remembered, Vicky had said that big galaxies can also bend light and they remembered that Vicky had said that but nobody had bothered to look. Now this was thrust on them, they were not looking for it but by chance they found this quasar which was twin and this is how they had come across. So let us see next. Uh, if you look at the ordinary lens, what happens? You know, ordinary glass lens. Uh, you you have bending of light like this. It goes straight here, then it is bent by refraction and, and you form it right there. So this is a ordinary lens. And because the uh, gravitational bending was producing a similar effect, astronomers called it uh, gravitational bending because it is produced by gravity. So remember the question that we were asking is there any other way of producing image with a uh, sort of uh, strange image which is uh, not due to reflection or refraction, but here we are getting it because of gravitation. So here you see the same thing. Uh, this is the galaxy and light ray is bending and you are seeing it from here and you are seeing multiple images. So gravitational lensing that you see here this is the, the typical scenario of one producing two images and uh, galaxy intermediate. So in many cases astronomers are able to identify a galaxy on the line of light which tells you that yes, it is most likely the culprit which bends light and produces this illusion. And you can see other strange effects uh, coming from this uh, lens, lens effect. You can get not only one image, uh, two images, you can get three, four more images. So here you see uh, a, an example of this, this is a central galaxy, the one, two, three, four. Four images of the same object. Uh, why four are because the light is split into four branches. Each one goes around this uh, central object which is bending it and you see therefore two, uh, four images. Then you also get sometimes one image but it is exceptionally bright. This happens because uh, the concentration of light by bending uh, makes it appear brighter than it actually is. Then you can sometimes see a ring of images, that is the ring dotted along, uh, the images dotted along the ring. Then uh, uh, you, you also see uh, strange galaxies. Now here you see and this galaxy which has this shape. Now such a shape is never seen for in ordinary uh, astronomy. So people say this cannot be the real image of a galaxy but it is distorted by gravitational density. Just as you saw in the picture I showed in the beginning a boy standing in front his image is distorted. So this is what lensing is doing. 
and one can identify which galaxies are doing it for, uh, to understand that particular thing. <coughs> so, uh, in 1978, uh, I just wanted to mention, before the idea of gravitational lensing became popular, uh, two of us had suggested that the distance between two components of a quasar separated by a few light years may be amplified by gravitational bending of uh, their rays by an intervening galaxy. So here what we were saying was that you have a source which is made up of two blocks and so those two blocks are moving apart and if you measure the distance and the angle by which they are going apart you come to the conclusion that they are moving faster than light, are moving away from each other with speed 3, 4, 10 times the speed of light. So you wonder what, whether you are looking at a physically meaningful thing or whether somebody is having uh, illusion. So the answer that we wanted to give was that uh, it is an illusion. What is happening is that the images of these two objects are what we see and the image gets distorted, it's bigger than the object and so if these two are moving with let us say 70% uh, of the speed of light, the image may be uh, separated with 10 times the speed of light. So that the magnification of image is produced that particular effect. So uh, this was an, uh, another possibility here is the, the same idea. A and B are the images, are the objects. Their images are performed here, A star, B star. And the distance being increased compared to original, they appear to move faster. So there is no violation of relativity in this case. So, uh, Gravitational lensing on a smaller scale uh, also takes place uh, and it is possible uh, to think of micro lensing. Now, the lensing examples I showed there was bending of light by big galaxies as Vicky has said. Now, uh, people said why don't, why don't we have small stars playing the same role on a much smaller scale. So, you have low mass stars which are on the way from, on the, they come in the way of a light ray emitted by a star to you. And that can produce effects which tell you that there is lensing going on. I will show you how this happens. So, here you see uh, different stars distributed and uh, uh, there is a star moving <coughs> like this. So you com concentrate on this moving star and then what happens is as it moves, uh, somewhere this one of the stars of the background, it comes in the way between this star and you and that produces a sudden brightening of the image of this star. So where I have shown the arrow, that particular star gets brightened for a while, for a, maybe say a few days, and then it fades. So if you see such an effect, then uh, you ask, you see here is, is a curve drawn which shows the that uh, the light intensity has gone up for a short while and then it fell down again. So you keep observing stars in our neighborhood and see whether any of those stars are suddenly brightening and then come going back to their original brightness. So if you see that you get into you get a gravitational phenomenon which is called micrograph. Now we have here uh, a simulator 
which can be made uh, in the lab which simulates what is happening in the uh, real case. So here the, the uh, simulator which is uh, uh, behaving like what you do if you have an optical object, lens like, but the shape you give to the lens is different from the ordinary lens you are accustomed to in your uh, laboratory. And so, uh, you, when you devise such a lens, it will reproduce the effect of gravitational bending. And you can even see this ring, which is called Einstein ring, uh, which is called Einstein ring, which is, uh, uh, you see, going almost round. What it, this ring is doing is, this is the actual object and you find that the images are distributed all along the way. There are infinite number of images. So this is a possibility and people have seen this. Now I want to end by another example uh, which uh, is of a different nature but which, is, which has also been seen. Uh, here you see distant mountains in the background and then there is a line of trees here and then these animals are there. Now when you look at it from here, these distant mountains, uh, they may be, you could say they are about three or four times as tall as the trees. But when you go close to the mountain, you find they are much taller. You have to climb, it's a really high plus. So what, what you say is that things look smaller uh, if viewed from a distance. So uh, we uh, ask this question. The perception of size by the brain is related to the angle subtended by the object on the beholder's eye. So let us see in Euclid's geometry what happens. Our <coughs> geometry that we learn at school. Uh, you have here uh, an object which is subtending an angle at uh, at the observer. So this is an object, and the angle subtended is this one. So now let's see uh, if the object goes further out this angle subtended is less. You again you can see it in this way. If it goes still further, then this angle becomes even smaller. So what it means is that object, if I take away from you, you will feel that it is getting smaller and smaller. And that is why in, those, in that uh, scenery which I showed you, the distant mountains look relatively less tall. So uh, the Euclidean geometry gives us something like this. Uh, but this is without gravitational lensing. Now if light bends uh, on its way from very far away object to us, uh, the effect can be quite different. So uh, in an expanding universe, it is uh, moving uh, in which galaxies are moving away from each other, uh, one can see this effect. And the examples are here. Uh, first of all, this is an expanding universe with the balloon with dots on it. And if you blow up the balloon, the dots move away from each other. This is what we actually see galaxies moving away from each other. And so we say, like a balloon, the whole universe is expanded. And uh, we can then say that uh, uh, in most models of this type of universe, expanding universe, the angle subtended by a distant source of light may actually be larger than the angle subtended by a nearby source. Now you find it very difficult to believe that something which is taken very far away looks very big. This is not what you are accustomed to, but that is what can happen. And people who study 
cosmology that is the universe or the large scale, uh, they are uh, anxious to check whether this effect is there. So, has this been tested? Yes, answer is. But the attempts so far have been ambiguous in their conclusion. So, the, the data or the error bars are rather large in our uh, measurement so far. So, we cannot say that this is being seen or not seen. But it is likely that as you improve and have better telescope, this can be tested uh, more accurately. So, uh, this is the hope with which I conclude that a definitive conclusion in this regard may be possible. Thank you very much. Uh, if light is bending, then how can you say, like if it's bent by gravity, how can you say that the speed of light is constant? Uh, I think uh, the effect is in sort of a four-dimensional sense. So, when the light ray is bent, uh, in a certain sense, its speed also is changed. But uh, if you measure uh, using Euclid geometry, you might say that the light is bending and the uh, uh, speed is changing. But if you use the geometry of the space actually there, then you may you will say that the light is not actually bent, but it is the space is bent. See, so it's. That is uh, the difference between Newton's way of looking and Einstein's way of looking. So that I would say, yes, there are such differences, but how you estimate them depends on the geometry you use. Good morning, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, if a star can form multiple images, how do we know that uh, whether it's a single star or two similar stars next to each other? Uh, this is always a problem to the astronomers when they see multiple images, not only stars but quasars and other things, to decide whether they are uh, really different stars they are seeing or they are images of one star. And that uh, often leads to some controversies. People draw conclusions using one interpretation, some other people draw with based on different interpretations, that they are really different stars. I had seen some images, uh, one image of uh, two galaxies. Uh, the, the two galaxies uh, look intersecting at each other. Uh, so that can be a illusion or not? There are a number of photographs available of interacting galaxies, which means galaxies which are merging and interacting with each other gravitationally. Now, this is this can this interaction can be in many different ways. So, it, what you see, uh, you, if you have this kind of effect, two one on top of other, it could either be straightforward two galaxies interacting. Or uh, if you can demonstrate it, you can also argue it is due to illusion. And there may be two, one galaxy, two images of one galaxy. But we are overlapping. That can happen because people have seen many different types of uh, lens images. As we know that the stars are forming uh, many reflections, so how do the astronomers come to know that it is a star or a reflection? You mean what you are looking at is uh, real or... Star or a reflection. Yeah. I, I think uh, astronomers generally go by um, their experience of uh, same kind of object in different populations. So, first of all, these images, images by lensing are not very common, fortunately. So, there are very few such cases where you get into the problem of saying whether it is uh, two objects separate or whether they are images of uh, one object. Now, as taking a spectrum can tell you more. If the spectrum is very similar, then they are more likely two images of one object. 
but if the spectrum shows some differences, then they have got to be different. So that is one way they can decide. They also look at colors and the radio images, different X-ray images sometimes. But that can tell us. Good morning, sir. I am Vedh Handekar, and my question is: If uh, suppose it's a distant star, now if light is traveling in form of waves, how will it actually bend? Yeah, it, it, even if light is a wave, that wave can be bent or channeled along a curve path. This can always, <coughs> this is past possible. The interpretation is a little difficult intuitively, but it is a channel. And the wave, wave character doesn't come in the wave. Good morning, sir. My question is that uh, what is the ra uh, what is the range of angles in which light can be reflected by a massive body? You see, uh, the original experiment which was performed by Eddington was based on uh, sun-like objects and how much the light ray is bent because instead of going straight, it goes in a different direction. So, what is the angle between the expected direction and the real direction. Now that angle is extremely small. Uh, you, you know angles are measured in terms of degree. If you divide degree by 3600, you get a unit called second, second of R. So the bending of light was of that order, second of R. It is extremely small and so people were arguing which one uh, is right depending on how accurately the experiment can be made. So uh, the angles are known or predicted depending on the model you use for the Has Has anybody counted how many total stars are there in the universe? Yeah, I, 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 I could get away with uh, the story of Birbal story. Uh, <laughs> How many crows are there in Delhi? So, so many billion or billion or whatever. Uh, and so, uh, as much as they have more, what do you say? So, some guests have come. If they have left, then they say that they have gone out on uh, holiday. So, in the, uh, not, not uh, so, much, so uh, arbitrary, but if you want to know how many stars are there in our galaxy, you have to make a model of the galaxy based on what you see and assume that there are typical stars like the sun. And then you ask, work out how much is the gravitational field of the galaxy at different points and that will cause motion of stars inside. So you have to do this kind of calculation and from that calculation you can estimate what is the mass of the galaxy. Then you divide it by the mass of this star, assuming it is like the sun, the sun's mass you know. Then you will get a number and that is the kind of number uh, you propose. Sir, uh, if we are saying that uh, light is bent because of the gravitational force, but force is equal to ma, but ma uh, light doesn't have any mass, so how can it bend? Well, uh, you can make an approximation uh, like this, that uh, light, first of all, carries energy. And the energy according to Planck's law is that if the frequency is mu, then the energy is h times mu. That is the formula which Planck gave for quantum mechanics for light. Now, if you take that energy and divide it by c square, that E equal to mc square, you get a mass, h mu over c square. Now, that is the mass which is gravitationally attracted. So, you do the calculation like that.